All right. Uh, good almost noon to everyone. Uh, today, we're very happy to have you here. Uh, this is the DCSU's first uh, Houses of Worship Roundtable that we've sponsored. You can see from this uh, title slide that we've we've got a lot of partners in, in this, and a lot of them are here to speak with you, and we'll get deeper into all of that uh, shortly, but I just wanted to take a, you know, to do a quick uh, welcome to everyone, and I'm going to hand it back to Kaylin right now to do a little bit of um, housekeeping on, on our side to make sure everybody knows uh, the expectations of the roundtable, and then I'll be back. Yes, yes, and again, my name is Kaylin, and uh, this is just, just some of the little expectations that we have here. There will be two Q&A sections um, in, at this event here today, and uh, totaling about 40 minutes, right? So if you have any difficulty uh, posting to the chat, you can post to the chat while the presentation is going on, but we will answer those when we get to those two, two Q&A sessions. There's gonna be a midpoint and uh, ending Q&A. So this is the chat here. I'll just say, I'll put this is chat, just so you all can see it. So if you have a question that comes up during the presentation and you don't wanna forget it, um, please feel free to post in the chat and we will address it in the order that we receive it. Um, and you also have the ability to voice your own questions the way that I ask that people do it. And I'll remind you guys of this as we get there too, but it's just to raise their hand and I'm raising it up and down and then I'll give you a shout and you can come on, come off mute and ask your question. Um, and, we'll, and I'll make sure to monitor the people raising their hands versus the questions that we have in the chat. There's also a Q&A button, which you can see here. Feel free to use the q and I'll monitor that as well. Whichever one is comfortable for you all works for me. So we are going to be recording, as you already noticed, we're recording through the session today. I just want to call out that even in the Q&A, we will be recording it. However, we will be taking that recording out um, when we post the recording online of the Q&A section. The presentation will remain in its entirety, but your Q&As will remain private just so you guys can feel comfortable with sharing uh, things about your buildings. Perfect, perfect. And I think that is all. Uh, and if you have any technical difficulties, please do shout out in the chat. All righty. And with that, I'll pass back to Patty to go through the agenda. Again, uh, welcome everyone. We've got um, a lot of information for you today and uh, hopefully a lot of help uh, to, to get you on track uh, with benchmarking and, and BEPS specifically in the, in the district. Uh, we have Ben Burdick. He is our Senior Director of Operations here at the, the DCSEU. Uh, he'll give a little bit of background on what we do here and, 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 and goals and, and things like that about the DCSEU. I believe Antonio is on the call. I haven't seen him yet, but from DOEE, uh, uh, he and Mark Erickson from the DC Green Bank are, are here to support you. If you have questions for DOEE or the DC Green Bank, uh, they won't be doing, uh, you know, they won't be included directly in the bulk of the presentation, but they're here to support you. Um, after that, we'll move into uh, Yolanda, who's going to speak about the Building Innovation Hub and give a, a lot of information about benchmarking and BEPs and deadlines and things like that. Um, at that point, we'll have a midpoint Q&A, and then we'll pass it over to Maddie, and they will be going over the um, the the uh, the offering that they have from Interfaith Power and Light uh, to support you in your benchmarking needs for Houses of Worship. Um, after that, I'll pop back on with my uh, partner in in uh, in what I do here at the DCSEU, Crystal McDonald, to talk about the offerings for um, for multifamily buildings that we should have removed there <laughs> for houses of worship. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A. So we're really looking forward to kicking this off with you. There we go, houses of worship. Um, and we're really excited that you took the time out of your busy days uh, to spend with us. So with that, I will now hand it over to Ben Burdick, our director, senior director of operations. Thank you, Patty. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. I'm really excited to have everybody here today. Um, We've done these roundtables for a number of years now, uh, led by uh, Patty um, uh, from our team, Crystal McDonald from our account management team, uh, and the Building Innovation Hub, among others, uh, have supported these across the board for many different building types. Um, so really excited to have um, Houses of Worship be, be a roundtable today. Um, these offer a great opportunity for us to uh, share information 
and resources uh, with you, and also an opportunity for you to um, hear from your peers about some of the things that they're doing, some of the, the issues that they're running into. It's a really great opportunity for peer sharing as well. So really excited uh, to have you on, on today. Uh, really excited to have the Building Innovation Hub, Interfaith Power and Light, uh, the DC Green Bank, and of course our client, the District Department of Energy and Environment, uh, all participating today. Uh, and uh, I will let uh, Kaylin go to the next slide, please. So a little bit about the DC SEU. Uh, we began our work here uh, in March of 2011, and really the DCSU is pretty unique, uh, and, and I have to call out the district for some of the, the really great forward thinking they've had with, with creating the DCSU. Um, it's really designed to make energy efficiency, clean energy more accessible to every person in the business of the district. So we really serve as both a financial and technical resource, um, learning opportunities, expert hand on the systems, and, and, and again, that vital financial support to help uh, help communities, uh, help buildings save energy, save money, meet their uh, sustainability and climate goals. Uh, since we got started, we have helped uh, district residents and businesses generate more than uh, 1.2, I think that's actually $1.3 billion in lifetime cost savings uh, across that time. So it really is having an impact and the work that, that uh, people like you are, are trying to pursue really is having an, a, a great impact here on the district. And we're really pleased to be a part of supporting that and making sure that you have the resources you need to do that. Next slide, please. So in terms of the DCSU goals, again, I say the DCSU is, is really unique in terms of energy efficiency, clean energy programs in the country, because not only are we here to um, help you reduce your energy costs, reduce energy, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but we also have um, a social component to a lot of the work we do. We wanna make sure that district residents are benefiting from the work that's generated here in the form of green jobs. We wanna make sure that local uh, contractors and local businesses are benefiting from this work happening. So we work really closely with certified business enterprises wherever we can. We also wanna make sure that uh, all residents are having access to the benefits of clean energy. So we wanna make sure that we're investing those dollars in low income communities uh, for residents that need it, need it the most. Uh, combine that also with uh, some goals around uh, uh, renewable energy generation, as well as helping buildings make those deep retrofits, make those deep energy savings where we can to really make a long-term impact on the operations of those buildings. So it's really, um, it's really a unique program. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm really pleased to be a part of this organization for the last 12 years. Um, and really pleased to uh, work with um, organizations like Houses of Worship uh, to help help you meet your sustainability goals, help you understand uh, how you can make changes to help you meet those goals. So um, really excited to, oh, oh sorry, let, let, me, let me take a step back here. One thing we did wanna call out um, right up front is, you know, starting in FY22, um, really in line with district's policy around uh, the Clean Energy DC plan is we no longer offer uh, incentives and rebates for natural gas projects for new natural gas uh, uh, equipment, new uh, fossil fuel burning equipment. But we do still support uh, with technical support and incentives, any operations and maintenance efficiency measures for existing gas equipment. So there is still the opportunity to take the equipment that you have in your building and make improvements to the efficiencies uh, of, the, of that equipment. Um, so I just wanna make sure that I call that out. Um, next slide there, please, uh, Galen. Um, really excited to have, uh, like we said, uh, several of our, our good friends and partners uh, on today. Um, uh, our hope is that this roundtable will really um, help you understand the resources, resources that are available from a technical support and financial support perspective across the district. As you look to comply with some of the requirements that are in DC, whether that be benchmarking or building energy performance standards, uh, really to understand how your building uses energy and then support your efforts to make improvements to reduce energy use, meet your sustainability and climate goals, um, and you know help help to help you continue to serve the important role that Houses of Worship serve in, ser in terms of serving the community. And we know that uh, it's often a significant challenge, uh, both from a time investment and a financial investment standpoint to make these improvements in your building. And we recognize that. So we wanna make sure that uh, this round table really does serve as an opportunity for you to understand all the res resources that are available. 
I'm not sure if uh, Antonio uh, has been able to join us yet, but really, we are really excited to have um, our client here uh, from DOEE. We're also excited to have uh, Mark Erickson from the DC Green Bank, uh, who has been a, a DC Green Bank has been a great uh, partner working with the DCSEU since they got started and really serve as a great resource. And um, Patty, do, do we want to have Mark come on and, and say a couple words and then we can jump right in? Sure. Yep. That works for me, Mark. Uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm really excited to be here uh, to meet with all of you. Uh, you know, as Ben said, we are supportive of you know, building energy efficiency uh, throughout the district. And we've been working with our colleagues at DCSEU and DOEE uh, to help make sure that these projects are successful. So I'm looking forward to hearing uh, your experience with these projects and trying to figure out the best way that we can help you all be successful in the projects uh, in the future. So look forward to hearing everyone's. Great, thanks Mark. And now I think next slide, yeah, I'll turn it over. Uh, to y Yolanda, who will introduce herself and uh, the Building Innovation Hub and the work she's doing there to help support. Take it away. Thank you, Patty. Um, as everybody said one, a couple of times before this morning, thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Yolanda Bonner. I'm the Associate Director of Building Performance with the DC Building Innovation Hub, also known as the Hub. Um, my background is in facilities management, having spent the last 16 years in that field, and I'm happy to now be a part of a team that is focused on helping DC reach its common goals. Um, and if you should have any questions after these slides, like Kaylin spoke earlier, they will be shared with you, but there's also a couple of emails throughout the slides to where you're able to email the hub if you have any additional questions afterwards. Um, next slide, please. And again, welcome to the 2024 House of Worship Roundtable session. Next slide. So I can't proceed without introducing the entire hub team. I'm one, I'm one third of a mighty team. Um, as you can see, Teresa Backus, the director of the hub, who's also on the call. Um, Mary Thomas, she's the associate director of the Building Innovation Hub. So anytime you email that email address that's associated with these slides, you're going to hear from either one of us. And we tried to do a quick turnaround time because we like to provide that type of service, but you can get us at any time, anytime you have any questions or answers. So a little bit about the hub, next slide, please. We're just a simple nonprofit. Um, we were created almost three years ago to support buildings in the district area, navigate to, navig to help them navigate new building regulations, like breaking down impl implications of DC's building energy performance standard, also known as the BEPS, and we're gonna get into that, while simultaneously helping to push the sector larger green building and climate goals. Next slide. So what is BEPS? We're just going to jump right on into this. A lot of we so we did take a look at some of the um, pre questions, um, pre registration questions. We know that a lot of you wanted to know what BEPS is, what does it involve? So we decided to go ahead and implement this instead of just jumping into third party verification and benchmarking. So a little bit about um, what exactly BEPS is. Simple, a regulatory tool that the district is using to help meet these green building and climate goals. The BEPS is a set minimum threshold of energy performance for existing buildings. These thresholds or standards as some would like to call are based on and measured against a building's demonstrated energy performance also shown in their benchmarking data. Under BEPS, the district aggregates individual building performance information per property type to establish a standard for the building type to meet. The standard for each property type is the median energy performance. So for example, median energy star score for all building types of that property type. If your building is performing better than the median for a multifamily housing, you're not required to take action under the BEPS. Buildings that do not meet the standard for their property type are required to improve their performance over the course of a compliance cycle and demonstrate the accomplishments at the end of that cycle. And you're going to see another slide later on through this where we talk a little bit, a little bit more about the compliance cycles themselves. Next slide. So people are asking why building performance standards? Why the BEPS? We spend about 80 to 90% of our time inside of a building, and we believe that better buildings improve lives. Therefore, everyone deserves to live and work in a high performance building. There are great opportunities to support the community and their priorities by increasing the chances of public health, 
housing affordability, economic opportunity, and an equi equity-centered approach for reaching those priorities. The BEPS is a powerful tool for the climate policy. And in the US, buildings are the largest greenhouse gas emissions contributor. 40% of total energy related to emissions is tied to those buildings. US climate commitments reduce greenhouse gas emissions 50 to 52% by 2030. Impossible to meet climate commitments without addressing existing buildings. Next slide, please. And so how most people ask, how does this relate to DC? So this is how the BEPS ties into DC's goal. And when you're thinking about DC and their goal to become carbon neutral, well, the district has admitted to reducing citywide emissions by 60% by the year 2030 and 100% by year 2045. We know that's really ambitious and in and, and trying to become carbon neutral, but we actually feel like we can do it. We're like the leading, com leading city across the nation right now with the BEPS and we're doing pretty good so far. And over 70% of the district's greenhouse gas emission, reducing the amount of energy used in buildings, especially in our existing building portfolio. It's paramount in order to achieve these goals. So this is why we're linked, the, this is why part of the building energy performance, we want to meet these goals. We want to make sure that not only are, you, are the streets safe, but the buildings that you spend most of your time in are safe. Next slide, please. So now that we've spoken to how the BEPS ties into DC's climate goals, we're going to get into the discussion of who does BEPS apply to. And in the district, large building owners, buildings 50,000 square feet or greater, have been benchmarking their energy and water performance for over a decade. Buildings 25,000 square feet and up have started benchmarking in 2021. And results from that first year are now available on DC's website. We have that link down um, in the bottom for you, and I'm going to go over those links too. So I know a lot of this is going to be, is a lot to wrap your head around, but I did think ahead and try to include some of these links to make it easier for you when these, shot, these slides are shared with you. So um, BEPS have size-based timelines. So as you can see, if you take a look at the illustration, cycle one, which is the cycle that we're in right now, affects private buildings 50,000 square feet and larger. Cycle two, which starts in 2027, will apply to private buildings 25,000 square feet and larger. Those are buildings that started benchmarking in 2021. And then cycle three, which is, which is set to start in 2033, will apply to buildings 10,000 square feet and up. Cycle one affects over 1,600 buildings, half of which need to improve performance. With cycle two, that number jumps to over 5,000 buildings affected as the size threshold drops. So if you take a look at the drawing, it simply illustrates what I just spoke to in more detail. And again, these slides will be shared with you, but you can clearly see how each building and each building size, where they are in this particular cycle. Next slide, please. I mentioned the compliance cycle earlier, and we'll take a and, and so now we're going to take a look at another illustration that counted that more clearly depicts where we are in this um in this certain in this BEPS compliance cycle one. Um, we talked about the DC BEPS, who it applies to. So now let's talk about the when. And this cycle lays out the when. Here you can see that the cycle itself started in 2021, as I mentioned before. We've already passed the milestone selection deadline for those buildings that don't yet meet the standard. Now we're currently where the orange star is. Um, I don't have the cursor, so I can't really circle around it. But if you notice the orange star in between... Um, the last year's deadline, April the 1st, and this current year's deadline. And I'm gonna pause right there to um, make a note that we did have some changes in this compliance cycle. Um, the initial deadline for this year, the benchmarking data was set for April the 1st of this year, but it was actually voted and we got an extension to move it back to July the 1st. So right now we have two weeks left from all of the buildings that are required to provide their benchmarking and data verification to submit um, their information to DOEE by July the 1st. And I can tell you there's still quite a few buildings on that list that have not, um, we have not been able to contact and get in contact with to let them know of this process. Um, but back to the slides. So we're now, again, where the orange star is, which is considered the implement, implementation stage. Everything needs to be installed and operational by December the 31st, 2025, for a year of benchmarking through December the 31st, 2026. With the end of this current compliance cycle being that same day, 
The district will then review and evaluate all data from buildings and determine if any enforcement is necessary. The next cycle starts the same day as that. There is an atypical year overlap because of a COVID delay built into the first cycle. However, it's important to note that for the next cycles, the district will reevaluate updated aggregated building performance and likely raise the level of performance for the next cycle of BEPS. Next slide, please. So this compliance cycle is just another basic overview of what we just went through, and we just kind of wanted to make it laid out in more simpler terms to get you to understand and see where we currently are in this compliance cycle phase. Next slide, next slide please. So I spoke to compliance pathways earlier, and there's a lot to wrap your head around when it comes to the compliance on um, pathways. I totally believe that um, I, when it comes to the BEPS, and, and I also am new, so I do speak the language of everyone on this call, I feel like giving you guys a glimpse of the entire pie instead of giving you a piece of the pie so that when you are engulfed in BEPS, you know exactly where you are, you've seen this before, you're familiar with it, you understand this process, and you can move forward. So the compliance cycle is, is definitely a lot to wrap your head around, but for builders that do not meet the standards, I won't go into a lot of details here, but I would like to highlight that the pathways options are created with flexibility in mind. Um, since there are so many unique situations with all different buildings, the optimal pathway selected depends on how far away you are from the standard in your specific situation. Since we're already past that first compliance um, pathway selection deadline, which was April of last year, I can say now that I was told that there were five, five houses of worship that um, had to choose a pathway. And out of those five, four chose the performance pathway and one chose the alternative pathway. So um, again, there are links in here. If this is, if I'm going too fast, if it's still not a, not a lot of time to wrap your head around it, I'm gonna cover those links towards the end. Um, next slide, please. So the next cycle, you meet the bets. Congratulations. You don't have to do anything, but what you do need to do is think ahead, think long-term. And here we just dropped a few sentiments to help you kind of guide you on your way to continue to be successful or to become successful and be prepared for the next cycle. Again, it's thinking long-term, future-proofing. How, how close are you to the standard? Where are you in your capital improvement cycles? Are you considering electrification? Factor in your tenant turnover. Is your benchmarking data verified? Have you had a level two energy audit? Do you have a team of experts and consider energy savings before BEP cycle two? Next slide. So um, before I do proceed, again, I do wanna make note that there have been quite a few developments in this um, BEPS process. You have the BEPS, BEPS task force, which includes a multitude of just a makeup of building owners, managers, industry organization, contractors, Anyone can listen in on these calls. They used to be every two weeks. Now I think they're down to quarterly. I did not include a link for that, but um, I would get with Kaylin at the end of this slide to include a link with that. And possibly you can get registered to know when those task force calls are coming up so you can join in and listen in on those calls. Um, the extension and flexibility. There's one-on-one -on -one support from DC DOEE to extend interim deadlines created to create custom compliance pathways and correct data errors. So, I, I like to tell everybody that I come in contact with, talk to DOEE, stay in communication with DOEE. And that too, I provided a link for you guys a little later and I'll go over that link as well. But the best, your, the best thing on your side is to just simply communicate with DOEE. If you can't reach us, reach DOEE. If you can't reach DOEE, reach us, D, reach DCSEU and our partners at Interfaith Power and Life. And then you have changes to BEPS based on stakeholder feedback from 2024. Alternative compliance, pen, um, I'm sorry, alternative compliance, I'm trying to blow my screen up. Um, alternative compliance penalty, alternative compliance payment. Um, my screen is, yeah, I'm a little blind over here, so I'm struggling. Let me pull it up a little bit more then. Okay, there we go. Alternative compliance penalty, alternative equals is 
equals compliance payment. Creating a whole cycle exemption for financial distress and for vacancy buildings, the baseline period. Adding language that specifically confirms that mechanical and electrical upgrades made in error to comply with BEPS are exempt from storm water regulations. Stream and streamlining the third party verification process for future years. Um, those are just some simple changes that have been in discussion between the playmakers here. And if you sign up for the hubs newsletters, DCSCU's newsletter, or Interfaith Power and Light, you'll always stay, you'll always be in the know of any changes that comes along with the BEPS. Next slide, please. So now we're going to jump and to um, a third party benchmarking and data verification. We're going to talk about best practices, how it's done, and its timeline. I do want to stop right here and let you know that what I'm going to discuss as it relates to the third party bench benchmarking and data verification is the actual process and what it is and how, how it's brought up and how it's made up and how it ties into BEPS. Um, our partners for Interfaith Power and Light, Maddie Smith, she's going to go into a little bit more technical details on how to get yourself set up to follow the actual process that DOEE requires. Next slide, please. So how it's measured, benchmarking and BEPS. The first step in improving energy efficiency is to understand how much energy a building is using. So for many years, DC Energy Benchmarking Program has helped building owners and property managers report their energy use. This year, DC is requiring third-party verification of that data. This means that a third party must review all of the benchmarking data to generate an accurate portfolio manager entry for the property. This third party cannot be the owner an employee of the building owner or any individual employed by the benchmarking provider. While the benchmarking, while the benchmarking provider updates and maintains the portfolio manager entry for a property, an annual benchmarking submission, a third party verifier is responsible for reviewing and determining that the information the benchmarking provider is using is correct and complete. You can't report that you've completed the, third, the verification until the third party verifier signs off on the checklist confirming your benchmarking data is correct. So therefore, the third party verification is important to the best because this means that all data that is traced by buildings and eventually feeds into the setting, this eventually feeds into the next cycle of BEPS. This will have to be verified for accuracy. This could also mean that building scores will drop or increase. The verification will be required every three years and must be completed by a third party verification uh, vendor. So um, simply put, when, we, when, when the building verification requirements first came on, there were a lot of individuals saying that we've we, we done this, we've done this. Yes, you've done it and you've done it during the, what I like to call the off season or the low peak season. But every three years, DOEE requires that everything that you've been doing be verified, data, data checked by a third party verifier. And those individuals have to have certain credentials and qualifications. And we have the resources to help you pinpoint those types of vendors, those qualified vendors. And that is within our vendor matchmaking portal. And I'll talk to that later on in these slides as well. So. Again, to just address that that question, because I get that a lot when people do reach out to me, you continue to do it on those off-peak years, but just remember on that third year, you do have to reach out to a third-party verifier to get them to just verify the data that you've been entering. And, um, and this information is also set up and tracked in Energy, Energy Star portfolio. I won't get into much detail of it because again, Maddie will speak a little bit more to the Energy Star portfolio account and it's set up. Next um, slide, please. So this next slide is just a third party verification timeline, which is a quick, in this overview, as noted previously, the deadline for submitting the third party benchmarking report was technically April the 1st, but it's now July the 1st, which is in two weeks. Um, the cycle will then repeat every three years, as I mentioned above, and with, in which we will show here in the purple, is that the benchmarking reports are still due April the 1st. This was only for Jul this year that we got the extension to July the 1st. So every three years expected to still be on April the 1st 
unless you hear otherwise. So every year it will still be doing April the first, but they are not uh, but are not required to be third party verified during those off peak years. So the next time that you do have to reach out to a, a vendor would be that third year, which is typically in 2027. A point of housekeeping, the timeline on, on our website looks a little different due to orientation, but the information here is still the same. And there's a link for that as well that I've um, included for you guys. Next slide. Here's just a more in-depth um, look at the data verification process. It talks about the different steps to take to make sure that you are successful when completing the third party verification information. Um, you can see here we do, we have a um, scope of work on the Building Innovation Hub's website that you can always tap into and it's free. Or you can use the scope of work that's tied to your NG Star portfolio account. Um, just make sure that you're, you're providing the correct documentation to Energy Star um, portfolio account. Make sure everything lines up, make sure everything makes sense. And then your next step is if you feel like you're off somewhere, if you've been told that you've been off or if the vendor tells you you're off, make sure you go in and do data correction because that is a big determining factor of your building score. Again, once all those updates have been made, check in with the verifier, have them certify the data, and then submit your report to DOEE. Next slide. And this too is just another simple step, just more defined without all the details on how to on what you can take to be successful in this third party and benchmarking data verification process. Next slide, please. All right, so we went through the third party data verification and benchmarking requirements and its process and how it's done and how it's measured. Um, I didn't get into too much technical details. I'm going to leave that up to Maddie. So we're, now we're going to end this with our last subsection, uh, which is pretty much um, FAQs and uh, just additional resources for you guys to be able to tap into, to tap into, um, to make sure this process is successful for you. Hello? You're still here. You're still on. Yes, the screen went blank. I can't see anything. Uh oh. And is anybody having trouble seeing my screen? No, I can see your screen. I'm Kaylin. Um, I think she's right. Just some of the people are empty and blank. Yeah. Uh, I can see your screen. It's there. Okay. All right. Let me just, I'm going to pull up my screen as well. So, um, and follow through on that way. But, um, so, like I was saying, these next sub slides are just simply slides that discuss different um, FAQs and FYIs, and it links to additional support for you to help you understand and go through the process of the, all of this. Um, the first slide, a lot of people like to know how do we fit into all of this, the Building Innovation Hub, since we're not a government entity. Um, here's a little snapshot of that. The individual person at the top with the question mark will be considered to be you, the Houses of Worship. And you can see all of the different government entities that pour into you along with us. They feed us, we feed you. <laughs> Simple put. We like to say that we sit, we're sit. we in the middle it, that, and, and we are able to provide a more flexible response to the things you need and how you need them and when you need them. Next slide, please. And this slide here just talks about a little bit more technicality of what we actually do here at the Hub. And the next slide, please. All right, so here we're gonna talk about those links that I've been mentioning since I've been speaking. My overall goal when creating these slides is because I knew the lack of support that a lot of the houses of worship were experiencing or, or the lack of, um, how can I say? I won't say lack of support because all of us have been here to support them, but I just want to make it easier because I know that the in-office staff is not like those of commercial staff. So I wanted to make these links something that you can just easily access and go straight to what it is that you need. And these first three links to me are very important. This first link here, just simply put, it helps you check your building status. You get to compare your building's evaluation against BEPS. That link is very important. So I say save it, bookmark it when you do get these slides. The next link is to know if your building is subject to benchmarking. That link takes you right to the DOEE link and it lets you know, type in your address, 
that too gives you the information that you need. The third link that I'll um, deem as a high priority is, to, is the link to finding out if you're subject to benchmarking and if how to find out your benchmarking data. Those two links, they sound alike, but they're actually pretty different. So I say, once you get these slides, bookmark these links for easy access so that you're not you know, searching all over everybody's website trying to find them. The next slide, please. The next slide and their resources are pretty much subject to the Building Innovation Hub. We have a ton of resources on our page that talks about the BETS compliant pathway and the timeline that I spoke to above. It also just goes into more detail on what the third party verification is. We have that scope of work that I mentioned that's free of charge to you. So if you want to use it to do, get your verification work done, you can. We also have a how to guide that's easy to understand and kind of helps you move through the flow of all of this. And then there's a guide on understanding the energy audit. Um, I find a vendor portal, which I like to call our baby here at the hub. This has made it easy for us to connect you all with the vendors that you need to get your third party verification work done. Once you click that link, you fill out the form and it comes directly to us and we begin to make that match for you with the vendors. It takes a lot off your plate, to be honest with you, because again, you have to go out and you would have to go out and find a vendor that has all the qualifications that DOEE requires. We do that for you, so we highly recommend that app if you don't have the time to go out and search. And then uh, one of our other top resources is just the one pager for the BEPS cycle one. It kind of goes over everything that I talked about early on in BEPS and what BEPS is and the current cycle that we're in. Next slide, please. And our final resource page are those helpful links from DOEE. DOEE has their help, doc, help desk and knowledge base um, page. They have a building on a portal. I suggest everybody goes in, click that link, go in and get themselves set up because it's easy access to communicate with DOEE. Um, and then DOEE has their has a language as well for benchmarking and third party verification. And they also have language for building energy performance, also the best. So these three slides here, um, I put my heart into them because it's something that I know would actually help you guys. So I hope that again, you take all these links, you save them, you bookmark them, and use them for future references. And with that being said, um, I think now we're gonna jump over into our first Q&A. Thank you for having me. And again, please reach out if you have any questions. Hi everyone, it's really good to be here with you all. Um, my name is Maddie Smith, my pronouns are they, them, uh, and I am with a local nonprofit called Interfaith Power and Light, uh, where my title is Clean Energy Shepherd. Um, and basically what we do, Interfaith Power and Light is a multi-faith grassroots organization and we work with congregations across the DMV on of all different faiths um, to help them speak out, uh, go green, um, and also learn. We believe that, you know, everyone's faith tradition has a lot to say about uh, caring for your neighbors and caring for creation um, and the environment. And so that's, we really help congregations live into their uh, values around that. And we do everything from, uh, you know, faith-based advocacy in the DC Council um, to, you know, me talking one-on-one -on -one with congregations who might be interested in solar or, uh, you know, need a heat pump um, or want to know about benchmarking um, and BEPS. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here's just a couple fun pictures from our work. Um, when a, so just to describe some of our work outside of, of BEPS and benchmarking, one thing I do a lot is coach congregations through the solar process. Um, and because, you know, solar is so lucrative in D.C., we have probably many congregations on this call who have solar. And so we have a map on our website celebrating all of the different uh, solar houses of worship across the region. Um, and I just wanted to, to show folks because uh, it's pretty cool. We also, uh, you know, this the picture next to it is of our light switch reminders that we would be happy to send to anyone's congregation for free um, to help. And we have, you know, different sayings that go with different faith traditions. 
um, to just help folks remind remember to save energy, um, which obviously may not help you meet BAPS necessarily, but uh, is just an example of the diversity of faith communities that we um, work with in the district. Okay, next slide. Let's talk about benchmarking. Um, so in my, so our, my organization has been supporting DC Houses of Worship with benchmarking since 2022, um, which was the, the first year that, um, or I guess 2021 was the first year that congregations bigger than 25,000 square feet were required to start benchmarking. Um, and so I'll just say, so right now we have about 120-ish worship facilities that are over 25,000 square feet that are currently covered by the benchmarking law. And I know we have a mixture of folks here. Some are from those communities and some are from smaller congregations that will be required to start thinking about and doing benchmarking next year. Um, and when, which is when the threshold drops to 10,000 square feet. And I'll just say for folks that are on this call who are either, you know, just learning or just focusing on this July 1st deadline and you think you're covered or, um, you know, we've been emailing back and forth about it, please don't stress out too much. It is two weeks away and I can help you get through it. We can get through it. I don't want you to stress too much about it, but if you're covered, we do need to start rolling on it. Um, I'm working really closely with DOEE um, and they know that, you know, it's going to take a little while to get some of our houses of worship across the line, but that we need to definitely start that process as soon as possible. So one thing I'll, I'll say is we have resources to help you get started with benchmarking because we know the vast majority of our houses of worship do not have specific, you know, building energy professional staff. It's often, you know, extremely busy admin people who are doing the benchmarking um, or volunteers. Um, and so I really want to be there to help folks figure this out. So this is just a screenshot of a worksheet we put together that can help you, you know, gather everything that you need to, to be able to start benchmarking, to create a portfolio manager account. Um, and I, if you email me, I can definitely send this to, to anyone who's interested and it can just help you get started with it. Okay, next slide. We also have this great uh, webinar from a couple of years ago that we did in partnership with DOEE that really, you know, it's about an hour long and it really walks you through, okay, here's how you create a portfolio manager account. Here are the details you need to enter specifically. Um, and so if, you've, if you're sitting here today and have never benchmarked, um, I think, you know, watching this can really help you figure out, uh, you know, creating your account, entering your details, um, and really help you get started with benchmarking. Um, Joanna from DOEE presented. She's great. Um, and I think this is this is helping a lot of folks just figure out how to get started. Um, and I'll just clarify. So to do the benchmarking, you'll have to create what's called a portfolio manager account. And that's an online uh, system software uh, that's created by Energy Star and the EPA. Um, and so this is like a very standardized thing that's used across the country. Um, and I think even in some other countries, but sort of the, the main way to document how energy efficient your building is. Um, and you, uh, even if you're not required to be reporting your benchmarking yet, you anybody can sign up for a portfolio manager account and start doing this with your building. Um, and it can be a good way to help you see sort of, uh, you know, what your building performance looks like, how you compare um, to other folks. And I think it can just be, you know, once you figure out how to do it, it can be a good tool to help you and your community start thinking about, you know, how can we save energy and save money so that we have more resources to do, yeah, to carry out our important mission 
or ministry together. Um, so if you email me, I'll send this to everybody. I'll make sure that Kaylin has a link to it as well to send out in the follow up email. Um, and I'll also just say that I'm totally available and would love to have one on one conversations with anyone that's struggling with benchmarking. You know, if you watch the video and you're still confused, I'm happy to hop on phone, hop on the phone or on Zoom to walk you through it. Um, you know, some of our communities have very unique buildings um, and so people are running into different issues, but I really want to be of service to the communities um, and please, please reach out if you're struggling or have questions or just want someone to, you know, take a look and say, OK, let, like, let's go to the next step and find a third party verifier. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to add here. I don't think so. Yeah, benchmarking can I think can feel overwhelming at first and you know, I really want to be a resource to you all to help you get started um, and I'm always happy to answer questions. Oh, the one thing I'll add is that you've bench if you've benchmarked previously and have gotten corrections from DOEE. So they've if they've emailed you back, say last year and said, oh, you have some errors in your benchmarking report. I can help you with that. I've figured out what most of the common issues are that houses of worship in particular run into. Um, and so if you have corrections, feel free to send them to me and we can work on those and make sure that we get you into compliance. So now I'll talk just briefly about third party verification, which as um, Yolanda said is required every three years, basically starting this year for buildings that are 25,000 square feet and up. So for those of you that are 10,000 square feet, you won't have to worry about this for four years. Um, but for those that are 25,000 square feet or up, you are required in addition to the benchmarking reporting requirement, you are required to hire a third party to verify that data and that's important. Teresa had mentioned a couple reasons why it's pretty important, but the main reason is that we really want to make sure we have the most accurate sort of snapshot of what your building looks like, how big it actually is and how you actually operate the building usage. Um, and so that that's sort of why it's important because we want we don't want, you know, if your building footprint is if your building gross floor area is inaccurate, um, then the district will think perhaps that you're more energy inefficient than you actually are. Um, and so you want to make sure we have the most accurate snapshot of your your worship building and how you're actually operating. So I know people are fairly stressed about this third party verification because most congregations, you know, aren't aware of this. You definitely don't have the money in your budget, which sort of the rates we've been getting um, quotes for have been around anywhere from, you know, a thousand dollars to a couple thousand dollars. And so my uh, I've put together a program to help congregations with third party verification. So we're working with a firm called Pulse IQ. Um, and they are offering our houses of any DC house of worship discounted third party verification services for $700, um, which is among the, I think that's the, the best rate I've seen. I think that's the best deal um, that you all are going to get. I'll also say that I totally recognize that $700, like an unexpected $700 expense is not nothing for the vast majority of our congregations and that we have a pot of money to help houses of worship in DC pay for this this year. I wish the pot of money was larger. It's not enough to cover the complete costs for every single you know, house of worship in the district. But I do have money. I do want to make sure that this is not a hardship for your community. Um, and yeah, I, I want to help you with that. And I'm hoping, you know, to put together a similar program in future years uh, to help 
houses of worship pay for this, um, particularly when the threshold goes down to 10,000 square feet. And we know, and I know most of those communities will have smaller budgets, um, and so the impact will be even greater. So just to say again, um, you know, I also, in exchange for this discount that Pulse IQ is able to offer, I'm doing a lot of the upfront admin work, like talking to folks like yourselves um, who are working on this in their congregations, gathering all of the documents. Um, the main things that folks need to be able to do the third party verification is um, copies of your uh, electric, water and gas bills um, for the uh, for all of the meters that your building has. Um, if most have probably one for each, but some have two or more, depending on um, what your what your building actually looks like. And again, one of the things we're discovering is that um, you know, determining the exact floor area, what's called gross floor area of your worship building um, is really important. And I'll also say that, so one of the all things to also consider that we wanna make sure is as accurate as possible is uh, the how you use your building. So when you create a worship facility, you know, when you input a property into portfolio manager and create uh, it's called worship facility usage. Um, that's like the default usage of your building, but we know that so many of our houses of worship are also serving their community in other ways by having nonprofit tenants that may be, you know, daycares or preschools or like a K through 12 school, or even I'm working with one congregation that has a medical clinic in a large portion of their building. And so it's important to make sure we report that accurately in Portfolio Manager because, you know, the, the standards for how much energy a school that operates all day should use versus, uh, you know, the rest of the house of worship that maybe is not utilized necessarily, um, you know, every single day of the week, depending on what your programming is like, like those are important nuances that we have to make sure we get right to make sure that, um, you know, we have an accurate picture of like what uh, standard your building should actually be held to. Okay, next slide. Okay, one related thing that I wanted to make sure I share with all of you um, is please, please, please go check your electric and gas bills and see if you're paying sales tax. Nonprofit houses of worship are exempt from sales tax in the district. And what I'm finding as people send me their energy bills for the third party verification is that about 35% of the houses of worship I'm currently working with are paying sales tax and you shouldn't be. Um, and in the case of, this is just a snapshot from uh, one congregation's bill, you know, and this is a larger congregation, I'll say, but they are paying, you know, one month of their PEPCO bill, they are paying, you know, over $200 in sales tax. And so that's also something I can help you with if you take a look at your bills and discover, oh my gosh, we are paying sales tax. Um, you know, I can help you reach out to the right folks at PEPCO and Washington Gas to get, make sure you get exempted. And then there's actually also a process with DC to go uh, and get three years of a refund of the sales tax you've paid back. Um, so please let me help you with that if you discover that that's the case. Because, um, you know, you could use those savings uh, potentially for, you know, thinking about energy upgrades in the future or paying for third party verification or, you know, anything else important that um, your community is putting resources towards. So please, please reach out to me if you take a look and discover that um, you're paying sales tax. It's pretty simple to figure out. You just have to send them uh, proof of your nonprofit status. OK, next slide. And I just also wanted to go over some of the, you know, unique challenges that I know that houses of worship face in this area and thinking about benchmarking and third party verification in comparison to um, 
you know, many other types of buildings around the district who may, who often have paid, you know, building staff that focus on this or a property management company that focuses on this. And so I, you know, recognize that a lot of the burden to do this is on volunteers or extremely busy admin staff. And so I really want to help alleviate that burden and let you know that, you know, you're not alone in trying to figure out benchmarking um, for your congregation. And so I'm talking to volunteers, particularly now as we get closer to the deadline, like yourself, um, to figure, you know, figure out how to get folks into compliance um, and make sure that we're reporting everything accurately. I'll also say a unique challenge that we're running into is that um, you know, so many of our houses of worship across the district are fairly old and have these, you know, beautiful old buildings um, and they don't always have, they're not always able to find the architectural documents or blueprints that we need to be able to verify, you know, how large their building actually is because the numbers we know that the DC government has that where they like think this is how large your building is are often not very accurate or even if they're off by just a little bit, you know, that's still important to make sure that we're reporting, you know, how energy efficient your building actually is accurately. Um, so one of the things I've been doing is if this is you, um, I can look through public records and just see what I can find. It's a fun, <laughs> fun skill I've developed in, in doing this work. And if you've had, you know, a renovation, or a solar project or some like any of that, some of that stuff is often available and we can, I can try to find it for you all. And then again, to just briefly reiterate, you know, I recognize that our houses of worship have pretty unique building usage and everyone is different and we have to make sure we report that accurately because so often for a lot of them, you know, the entire building usage is not necessarily considered house of worship we have to allocate the specific square feet um you know if you host a school in part of your building or uh, a preschool like those are important things that we have to take into account and then also recognizing that you know none of you are for-profit companies that have you know a ton of extra money laying around in your budget to pay for this and so that's also where I really want to be of service and to make sure because we know that the district's houses of worship they want to do their part in meeting the district's climate goals um, and are often sort of leading the way in their communities in terms of thinking about you know green solutions um, or you know proudly displaying solar on your roof and that I really want to make sure that you know complying with this law is not a burden for you all. Okay, I think that's everything I wanted to say. So yes, please reach out to me. Um, I'll also just say that if you're in the 10,000 square foot, you know, range and are just now thinking about this, like you don't have to wait till next, till the end of, uh, you know, you don't have to wait till April 1st, 2025 to do your benchmarking. You could start now and like, you know, every month when you get your energy bill, you know, just enter the data. Um, and so like that's an easy, that's a way that you can get started and make sure you don't have this, you know, big stressful burden. Um, I don't want anyone to stress, but make sure that, you know, it's a little easier on you. So yes, please call me, please email me. I want to be of service to you all. And yeah, really glad to be here with you all. And thank you so much. Great, I guess I'll take it from there. Um, thank you, Maddie, Yolanda, Teresa. Um, as you can tell, you have a, there's there's a bunch of us here that really care about this and and really want to help you. Uh, if that hasn't come across yet, <laughs> maybe I can add a little bit more um, more of my energy to this. But we're we we really want to help, and the district wants to help. And you've heard them mention a few times. You've heard people mention a few times that reaching out to DOEE if you have a question or a concern or you've received a letter or or something like that, they are really here to help. They don't want to find anybody. They want to really just hit the climate goals and they want to support you. So get with them earlier rather than later and, and you'll definitely um, you know, benefit from that. 
Um, so my name is Patty Boyd. I, I came on at the very beginning. Um, my, my I'm director of technology and innovation at the DCSU. I've been here uh, for 11 years now, and um, my job is to figure out the, the 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 next thing that the DCSU is going to do um, in terms of technologies and and things like that. Um, uh, also, uh, Crystal popped up, so Crystal McDonald, she'll be doing uh, the second half of our DCSEU presentation, our Director of Account Management and Workforce. Um, but with that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here to try to help you navigate our programs and services. So if you find yourself in a position where you must make improvements or you are simply just um, going out and trying to do, get, you know, have your energy use go down or you know you've reached uh, maybe the end of life of a, a piece of equipment uh, that we do have rebates and incentives available for you uh, and I'm, so i'm trying to uh, this presentation will help help uh, guide you through that uh, crystal would you like to add anything before we start our part no, i think you're fine patty thank you okay uh, next slide please so um we have uh, different offerings that we have at the DCSU. We have a whole section of our offerings for affordable housing, um, shelters, clinics, things like that. Um, when it comes to to houses of worship or you know uh, other types of market sectors, we call those uh, rebates and incentives our market rate offerings. So houses of worship are included in our market rate offerings. Uh, that's just kind of the terminology that we use in in our um, in the world of uh, of energy efficiency. Uh, next slide, please. So this this slide is is relevant uh, if you if the houses of worship owners manage their own appliances. So it's in the residential. That's why I have it in quotes here. Rebate section. That's really our efficient products. So if you're going to put in a, a new heating system, again Ben Ben mentioned in the beginning that we are not incentivizing new boilers, furnaces, things like that. But if you're going to put in a heat pump. Um, for heating and or air conditioning, there's a rebate for that. Uh, if you have to replace your water heater, uh, there's a rebate for that. D if you're doing putting in a dehumidifier or washers or dryers or you have electric lawn equipment, um, there's rebates for that or the refrigerator in your in your um, in your um, in your lunchroom or or wherever you you might have a, a cafeteria or something like that. Uh, we offer rebates for that. Um, so it's it's pretty simple. Uh, like just as as it's called a residential rebate. For example, I purchased a refrigerator for my condo. Um, I go. I had the Best Buy website open on one side. I had the DCSU website open on another side, and I took the. I found a refrigerator that I liked, and I took that uh, model number. And you can look up that model number on the DCSU website and see if it's eligible for a rebate. Um, so you you know you you turn in your receipt and then we send you um, the, the rebate and it depends you know three set the first one there the three seventy five to seven hundred it depends on the efficiency of the new piece of equipment that you are purchasing um, and all of the equipment must be qualified and again the qualified lists are on our website uh, next slide please. So then, then we move into what we call our commercial rebates and incentives. This is for larger, like on a larger scale. If you're um, if you're working with a contractor to install energy efficient equipment, um, if you have you know food service and vending machines, if you have large HVAC equipment, uh, if you have a lot of lights, like you're going to redo the the entire lighting in the facility, um, and you or your contractor can apply for a rebate from the DCSU by going to our online rebate center. And there, there is the link. We also partner with distributors um, in the, in the district uh, to provide a rebate to buy down the cost of bulk lighting um, in um, for, but it also has to be qualified. It has to be qualified at using the design lights consortium qualified lighting list. Um, and we also have instant rebates through our distributors for um heat pump mini split and heat pump water heaters. So your contractor can purchase the equipment directly from a local distributor and get an instant rebate at that point. Um, and we also have links to, to find the list of local distributors on our website. 
Uh, custom incentives are typically for larger projects. Uh, this is where we we get you and your facility. We have an account manager assigned to you. We uh, have an engineer possibly assigned to you, and we work with you if you're changing out a large chiller or or making you know large improvements that are a little bit unique, uh, where the hours of operation might differ from uh, standard hours of operation, and we would work with you to figure figure that out. Um, but it, we have a link on our website, start a project. So if you don't know exactly where you fit, you can click on that and we will be able to get somebody in touch with you to see uh, how we can help. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna do a couple of examples of, of efficiency measures that you might find uh, in, in your facilities. And, and they kind of apply to most facilities because in the district, the buildings, which is our largest uh, source of, of energy use and emissions, you know, what do we have? We have heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and lighting, right? So those 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 apply to smaller buildings, they apply to houses, they apply to, you know, larger buildings. So if you have replaced LEDs more than five years ago, and in my condo, um, I, I've, I live in a condo, and when I first moved in, I had a, us replace all the LEDs, and that was 10 years ago, and, the, and, and they've lasted for 10 years, but now we're starting to replace them with a little bit more ener energy efficient um, technologies. So if you if you got LEDs more than five years ago, there's an opportunity um, for uh, ener more in energy efficient models as well as cheaper lighting controls where you can turn things on and off when you need it to be. You can have day lighting. There's there's a bunch of different occupancy sensors, vacancy centers, sensors. You should possibly consider that. And there are a lot of lighting vendors that will come out and give you a free quote on a possible project. Um, the next thing is installing smart thermostats that it can learn the preferred space temperature and build a schedule around this. I have, I have that might even be my hand there from that picture. I have um, a Nest that is a Nest thermostat. I have one in my in my condo and it's really handy. I can control it from my phone um, and it it does. And when I leave the house, it knows I've left and it it changes the set points to allow for not cooling as soon as I would want it to cool when I'm there and not heat as soon as I would want it to heat, you know, when I'm there. Another thing is if you have uh, larger systems, chillers or boilers, you doing retro commissioning can save energy uh, by making sure that those systems are operating as efficiently as possible. So those are just three examples of, you know, you don't have to go out and change everything, but these are three, you know, relatively cost efficient uh, measures that you can undertake to um, save energy in your building. Next slide. So we also at the DCSU offer no cost technical support. Again, it's not necessarily around the benchmarking and the BEPS uh, type work, but on these ener energy efficiency measures. Um, it's possible that we could work with you to review your utility bills and your energy data to see how the building uses energy to try to make suggestions. Um, if you've received quotes, uh, we are. It's possible for us to provide a reality check on on the equipments, on the design, and the claims of energy. You know what what they're claiming. You would save. Uh, we're kind of a third party neutral uh, opinion to make sure that what they're what they're saying is happening is correct. Uh, for a select, uh, you know, we can't do it for everybody, but we are able to do walkthroughs to get just not. It's not an audit, but to get like a just a you know like oh wow it looks like you sh you could get somebody to come in and look at your lighting you could get somebody to look at your retro commissioning um helping guide you in the right direction and then when you do have um a project we can develop help develop savings estimates and the economic benefits uh we use a very conservative methodology so hopefully it would end up being more than than what we state uh but we can try to calculate the impact of what uh you know what you what you're going to see and then at the end especially on the custom side uh provide you with an incentive amount to help offset that incremental cost of adding the more efficient uh energy efficient equipment so that's basically, uh, those are our, our products that we can offer you, uh, it, which are rebates and incentives. And we'd love to hear from you. We're gonna have a contact at the end of the, the presentation that you can reach out to, but you can go straight to our website and click that start a project and we will find uh, exactly where you need to go. And with that, I will turn it over to Crystal uh, to talk about renewables. 
Thank you, She'll Patty. Start yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Uh, before I get started, I did see a question pop up about uh, building envelope incentives. We do yeah. not have prescriptive incentives for building envelope measures, but they are considered when we do a whole building analysis. If you're doing multiple uh, efficiency measures, we will do a whole building analysis, which will include the impact of those building envelope measures on our custom programs. So just wanted to mention that and um, a little type of an explanation in, in the chat as well. So um, moving on to some additional technologies, we're going to look at our renewables and uh, where we can provide support for uh, renewable uh, programs, uh, primarily solar projects in the district. Uh, Maddie showed a fabulous map early on. Uh, however, we are exploring opportunities for geothermal and other uh, types of renew renewable uh, technologies. So uh, next slide, please. So under the Solar for All program, which is probably a familiar term, we do support uh, CREFs. That's the Community Renewable Energy Facilities. Uh, community solar provides the benefits of solar to residents who can't install systems on their home, including renters and homeowners whose rooftops are shaded or need repairs. A community solar project is not located on the home, but offsite, and the benefiting household receives a credit on their PEPCO electricity bill each month. One of the benefits um, to note for House of Worship is that CREFs can provide potential lease payments from the solar developer and potentially support other building improvements, such as a new roof. And I do have an example of a CREF um, just a few slides away. Next. The, old, the, the other solar incentive opportunity is on the market rate side that uh, Patty provided a definition for our market rate incentives. So these are incentives where uh, we have customers who are interested in solar but do not meet the income qualifications for the solar for all or community solar projects. So we do offer incentives for installing the PV systems um, and they can be coupled with other energy efficiency upgrades. So you will uh, receive incentives to cover both solar as well as energy efficiency equipment. Um, and again, these uh, incentives are not uh, designed to cover the whole, the total cost of the project, but the uh, the expected amount of solar energy generated per year. So you'll see receiving an incentive based on the megawatt hours um, generated. And then um, a customer must sign a third party payment authorization form if they want to release the incentive payment to uh, your contractor or, or developer that you're working with. So there is that and that possibility as well. I've seen where uh, these incentives are calculated in the economic analysis for um, evaluating a potential sol uh, solar project. So just wanted to mention that. Next slide. Programs and actions. Uh, what better way to explain the story than to share some of our project showcase opportunity, well, projects that we can showcase from our community. Next slide. This is an example of a community renewable energy facility. This is a uh, Sargent Memorial Presbyterian Church in Ward 7. And uh, they have been successful with their project. Uh, the church is home to a 256 KW solar project, which provides approximately 73 households with access to locally generated clean energy. And then the qualifying households receive subscriptions at no cost to cut their overall electricity bills in half. The resulting aggregate savings for these income qualified households uh, total approximately uh, $547,000 over a 15 year uh, of the 15 year uh, life of the project. Ideally, 
they will experience more savings. But as Patty mentioned, we do an, analyze our projects on a conservative basis. Next. We do offer comprehensive set of energy services available to owners and managers of any large building in DC who are replacing old equipment, renovating an existing building, or beginning a new construction project. It is important to note that the your overall operating hours, a Sunday only versus in, an occupancy throughout the week basis, and then uh, as has been mentioned, equipment efficiency ratings above the baseline or standard code. So this is an example of uh, two different uh, incentives. We work with two different churches on their chiller replacement. And you can see the, the year built, uh, the, um, the equipment that's being replaced, and then the dollar incentive, which are different, and then, oh, and then the annual estimated electric cost savings. So you'll see all the details and the, the differences in details are not just about the equipment, but the occupancy hours, as well as the efficiency rating of the equipment. And so we will give you an economic analysis to calculate the estimated annual savings, the uh, metric tons of GHG emissions, uh, emissions that are reduced. And uh, project A, it's like cons consuming 4,077 gallons of gasoline per year. So we've saved that and removed that from the environment. And then pro project B, it's like consuming 3,616 gallons of gasoline per year. So that just gives you um, a scale of your savings in consumer terms. So we do have uh, two capacity building programs to meet the demand of the district's clean energy goals, which influence uh, uh, which are influenced by uh, the, the building codes and energy performance standards. The first program is really uh, geared towards the contractor community. It's the Train Green Sustainable Energy Infrastructure and Capacity Building Pipeline Program. That can be um, a tongue twister, so we just refer to it as Train Green. This is where contractors or your staff who are managing your facilities can uh, acquire new or enhanced skills around energy efficiency and renewable energy design, construction, inspection, and maintenance. We offer, um, we offer educational pathways, five educational pathways at various levels, introductory, intermediate, and advanced courses. The educational pathways include energy efficiency, sustainability and health, which was very important post-pandemic, uh, building operations, HVAC, renewables and solar, and then our newest pathway is uh, design and new construction. All who participate earn a certificate of completion or they sit for an exam for a nationally recognized uh, credential. These courses are offered at no cost to the, the participant and uh, if you want to see some of our archived courses we've done in the past few years, you can just take a look at our DCSEU YouTube channel. Then on the other side, we have a workforce development program geared towards the individual. This is a twice a year uh, a program where we offer district residents with uh, a five, a three to five month green externship working with local contractors or other organizations to discover new careers in energy efficiency and sustainability. So we accept our participants all across the spectrum who are interested in entering a green career. So during the program, the externs receive a DC living wage, job skills development, on-the-job training, they too can earn nationally recognized certifications at no cost to them and direct work experience with the contractors and customers that the DCSEU works with. Uh, we do offer tr weekly training on energy efficiency topics and uh, soft skills 
like financial literacy, resume writing, preparing your uh, LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn profile, and so on. We also work with staffing agencies to assist with job placement. Um, ideally, the, the mentors or the host sites, they play a key role in not just training the externs, but also hiring them at the end of their cohort. So it's a win-win for all involved. Next. So we've had some inquiries recently and just wanted to make you aware of some other opportunities that have come up recently. Next, please. This is a slide to describe the federal funding opportunities with a huge disclaimer. The DCSU does not offer tax advice. The following is purely for informational purposes only, and a tax expert should be consulted for more information. The Inflation Reduction Act signed in 2022 is a major investment in the American economy uh, in energy security and the climate. So you can learn more about the types of tax credits and requirements. Um, there are several bonus credits that can be added onto these tax credits and increase the base value of your, your tax credit overall. Again, contact uh, the your, your CPA, your tax advisor, uh, the Interfaith Power and Light. Thank you, Maddie, for being present today. Or you can go directly to the IRS page that with the link that's here um, for more information on how you can benefit from this federal uh, opportunity. And there's also a link to another article that further explains um, the, the types of uh, tax credits and opportunities that the House of Worship um, can find beneficial. Next. There are some program areas that we did not cover today. If you have any questions, please let us know your concerns. Gabriel Kuna is the account manager who will partner with you to work through our programs and be the liaison with our engineering team. So feel free to book time with Gabriel or give him a call to initiate a conversation about your project. While Gabriel, Gabriel is um, out of the office today, he is represented by Yvonne Coles, his manager. Thank you, Yvonne, uh, so that you can be available to respond to any immediate questions. Uh, but yeah, Gabriel is, is assigned to House of Worship and other nonprofit organizations in the city. So with that said, um, I thank you for your time and attention.